Hello and welcome back to the Step 1 Biochemistry Pathway Series for 12daysofmarch.com where we'll try to focus on some of the high yield biochemical pathways for the Step 1 boards exam. As always, if you have any questions or comments regarding this or any of our videos, please feel free to reach out to us at 12daysofmarch.com or directly by emailing Howard at 12daysofmarch.com. Today we'll be talking about fructose metabolism, and as in all of our pathways, we'll try to focus on specific elements of the pathway that will help us navigate our way through questions we're likely to see on our Step 1 exam. The elements of the fructose pathway we'll be focusing on today are where the pathway starts, where the pathway ends, what the goals of the pathway are, what are the key enzymes we need to get from start to end, and what do they require to function? Key disorders related to this pathway, and how the pathways come together in the larger context of metabolism. Finally, we'll summarize by talking about therapies for these disorders, and how these disorders are typically presented in the context of questions for boards. To highlight our key pathway elements for fructose metabolism, we can see that we start with fructose, end with glycerol or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Our goal in this pathway is to generate usable energy from fructose. The key enzymes involved in this pathway and the pathway-related disorders are fructokinase and aldolase B. The key disorders associated with this pathway are essential fructoseria and fructose intolerance. And putting this into a larger context, we can see how this pathway will fit into the pathway for glycolysis. So this is our entire pathway laid out from left to right. As we can see, this process begins with dietary fructose, which as highlighted here, is typically ingested as fruit or fruit juices in kids. The first step in our pathway is to convert dietary fructose to fructose 1-phosphate with the enzyme fructokinase. The next step of our pathway involves converting fructose 1-phosphate to one of two products, dihydroxyacetone phosphate or glyceraldehyde, through the enzyme aldolase B. It's important to note that regardless of which of these two products is produced from fructose 1-phosphate, the ultimate product is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And this occurs through enzymatic pathways that aren't necessary to remember for your step one exam because they're usually not associated with any specific pathology or clinical condition. And as we mentioned before, the ultimate purpose of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is to enter the larger pathway of glycolysis. In this slide, we've taken the pathway we just learned for fructose metabolism and placed it on the left, and we've taken the pathway for glycolysis and placed it on the right to help highlight how these two pathways fit together. As we can see here, the arrow shows that one of the products of the pathway, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, can enter the process for glycolysis directly. However, the more common way for these two pathways to intersect is by the end product of the fructose metabolism pathway, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, to enter the process of glycolysis directly itself. From here, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate will continue down the pathway of glycolysis to produce pyruvate and ATP. So we can see that we have already highlighted two of our key elements by showing where the pathway starts with fructose and where we end, namely with glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or the byproduct glycerol. The next question we want to answer then is what the ultimate goal of this pathway is. So as we've highlighted above, the overall goal of this pathway is to take a dietary sugar, fructose, and convert it into a product that can be used in the cellular energy pathway, namely glycolysis. As with many of our pathways, problems in this pathway typically arise when enzymes are missing or deficient, leading either to a failure to utilize fructose or an accumulation of dangerous byproducts. Because of this, learning and understanding some of the key enzymes that will get us from the start to the end of this pathway will also help to highlight some of the key disorders that are related to these pathways and are likely to show up on your Step 1 exam. The two main conditions associated with this pathway are essential fructoseuria and fructose intolerance. For each of these pathways, there are different enzymes involved, and they typically produce vastly different clinical presentations. The first disorder in this pathway is essential fructoseuria. This is an autosomal recessive condition that, as the name suggests, is essentially the presence of excess fructose in the urine. As highlighted in the diagram to the right, this disorder involves a lack of the enzyme fructokinase, which normally converts fructose into fructose 1-phosphate, using ATP in the process. Without this enzyme, fructose cannot be phosphorylated, and because of this, it cannot enter the cell. And because of that, it cannot be metabolized. Because fructose can't enter the cell, it remains at relatively high levels in both the blood and ultimately becomes excreted in the urine. It is worth noting, however, that in patients with essential fructoseuria, a backup pathway is activated in the body, by which fructose is phosphorylated instead by the enzyme hexokinase, which is normally dormant in people without this disorder. Through this enzyme, patients with essential fructoseuria are able to produce small amounts of fructose 1-phosphate, which then completes the normal pathway. Regardless of this, however, this is a disorder that is typically associated with no clinical symptoms, other than that fructose can typically be detected in both the blood and the urine. The second disorder associated with this pathway is fructose intolerance. Fructose intolerance, like essential fructoseuria, is an autosomal recessive condition, 
but in this case it involves a lack of the enzyme aldolase B, which serves to convert fructose 1-phosphate into its downstream products, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde, which ultimately causes fructose 1-phosphate to accumulate. This accumulation, however, does not impact the activity of fructokinase, which continues to phosphorylate fructose into fructose 1-phosphate. Because of this, fructokinase will continue to convert fructose to fructose 1-phosphate, wasting valuable ATP in the process. Because of this, symptoms of fructose intolerance relate to the depletion of ATP and to the accumulation of fructose 1-phosphate in liver cells where it's become trapped. These symptoms include hypoglycemia, jaundice, hemorrhage, hepatomegaly, and hyperuricemia, all of which can essentially be thought as induced liver failure due to accumulation of dangerous fructose 1-phosphate inside the cell. So now that we've covered most of our key pathway elements, we'll focus on how these disorders come together, how they're treated, and how they'll likely show up as questions. And just to remind you what the pathway looks like altogether, we've included a slide showing the complete pathway. So the way that essential fructose urea will usually show up in a question stem is when a child will have urine that smells sweet after a big meal of fruit, honey, or anything else that contains a lot of fructose. At this point, they'll usually be worked up for diabetes that will show high levels of fructose in the urine instead of glucose on urinalysis. This will tend to run in the family and skip generations because, as we mentioned before, it is recessive. Typically, no treatment will be required, and a question will usually ask about either the parent pattern of inheritance, which is recessive, or the enzyme that is missing in this disorder, which is fructokinase. They may also ask you about which enzyme is being upregulated in the backup pathway that we discussed earlier, which, as you may remember, is hexokinase. Fructose intolerance, on the other hand, has a much more dramatic clinical presentation. In this case, you'll likely be dealing with an infant who develops symptoms of lethargy, jaundice, vomiting, or hypoglycemia after the first meal that they have that contains either fructose or sucrose, which is, again, fruit, honey, or something like that. Treatment in this case involves strict avoidance of fructose and sucrose. In this case, they may ask about the pattern of inheritance, which in this case is recessive, the miss or the missing enzyme, aldolase B. Another way they may ask about this pathway in general is the process by which fructose enters glycolysis, and the intermediate in that case is again glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And that's all we have for fructose metabolism. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to leave them on YouTube or to contact us directly at howard at 12daysofmarch.com.